Hello, and welcome to Are We There Yet? Market Scale's online video podcast that highlights the most exciting things happening within transportation today. My name is Grant Harrell, and as your host, very excited to speak with the voices of today's most exciting companies within transportation technology. We'll speak with the voices of automotive, aviation, supply chains, to space travel, discovering truly what's at the cutting edge of transportation technology today. Topics within the Are We There Yet? online video podcast series include head-to-head autonomous vehicle racing, how about your own personal aircraft taxi service, ride sharing for kids, never have to hear your kids screaming, are we there yet from the back seat again, how about drones delivering your goods and products to your home, or robots delivering your lunch. Not sure if you'll have to tip the robots, but we'll find that out soon within the upcoming series. This isn't Star Wars or Star Trek nor science fiction. This is market scale, and these are the most exciting things happening today within the world of transportation. And so today we discuss autonomous vehicle racing. And here to talk with us about that is the organizer of the world's first autonomous head-to-head vehicle racing challenge, Chief Executive Officer of Energy Systems Network, Mr. Paul Mitchell. Paul, thank you so much for your time today and welcome to Are We There Yet? Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. So, Paul, I must ask, did you drive your car to work this morning or did your car drive you? So I, I, I drive a Tesla, so it was a, a little bit of both, right? I, um, I, I drove myself to work, but I try to recall if I put it into um, kind of the driver assist self-drive mode, so maybe, maybe a little bit. But, uh, yeah, no, I drove myself for now and, and look forward to, uh, to not having to do that in the near future. Of course, of course, I do as well. And I'll tell you, I don't mind my morning commute. It's always a nice opportunity to listen to a podcast, but uh, very excited for the day where the car can just drive me to work and I can enjoy all of these great video podcasts. So very much looking forward to that. Paul, we're, we're all very familiar with the Indy 500, with NASCAR, with Formula One racing. But for any members of our audience uh, out there, uh, the idea of autonomous, driverless, head-to-head racing uh, is a fairly new concept. And so fitting within the theme of the Are We There Yet series, we're very excited and anxious to ask you. Head-to-head, autonomous, driverless vehicle racing competitions, are we there yet? Well, I mean... I. I think the, the the simple answer is is yes. We we arrived at that point um, on January seventh at at CES at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway uh, when the Indy Autonomous Challenge held our our second autonomous racing competition uh, called the Autonomous Challenge at CES and and we had head to head two cars at a time passing each other at increasingly higher speeds, fully autonomous. Um, and the, the winner was, was, uh, successfully passing at more than 165 miles an hour. So, you know, it, 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 we're there in the sense of, of, of head to head autonomous racing. Yes. Uh, but we've got a long way to go in order to, I think, achieve the goals and aspirations that we have, uh, for the future of, uh, of, of automation and autonomous, uh, motorsport. How exciting to hear. You you mentioned passing each other at, at incredible speeds. Can you give members of the audience out there uh, an idea of what kind of speeds were achieved within the race? Yeah, so um, just to back up a little bit, like in the Autonomous Challenge, these are um, fully autonomous race cars. Uh, they, they If you look at them, they're going to look similar to uh, an Indy car or, or specifically a, what's called an Indy Lights car. Uh, that's one of the kind of entry level series for, for the IndyCar series. Uh, but it's been modified where, where the driver would normally sit. That's all been replaced with, uh, an autonomous stack of sensors and supercomputers and, and technology that allows the vehicle to operate fully autonomously. Um, and we've been running these vehicles, uh, with university led teams, uh, since, um, uh, really June of 2021. Uh, when the teams got their cars, we built 10 of these race cars. Um, and, you know, between that time and where we are today, these teams train these vehicles to start going, you know, 30 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour autonomously. And then eventually, you know, we were able to hit much, much higher speeds. And where, where we are now, to, to answer your question very directly, is, you know, our, our teams have achieved 
um, racing at speeds of in excess of 160 miles an hour, uh, just touching around 170. And that actually is the limit of the way we've set the car up from a from an engine standpoint. Um, so the next phase for us will be to go to higher speeds. But to do that, we're actually gonna have to make some adjustments uh, to to the engine to uh, to boost the power, boost the, the, the horsepower to accommodate higher speeds. That's incredible. 150, 160 miles an hour. Uh, as, as I listen to you describe that and the supercomputers that are involved in the uh, autonomous technology itself, I can't help but wonder how would some of today's top automotive racing drivers fare against the autonomous vehicles? Has the, the idea of autonomous vehicles versus traditional manned vehicles uh, in a single competition uh, ever ever crossed your mind? So sure, sure. I mean, I think people always kind of bring up that topic of man versus machine. Um, we're a long way away from from having an autonomous race car that can compete head to head with the world's best uh, drivers, whether it's for IndyCar, NASCAR, Formula One. Um, you know, there's no way we're going to be able to to replicate what Elio Castro Neves is, you know, did at the the Indy 500 um, with where the technology is today. Um, but what I would say maybe is, is more likely to happen in the near term is the, the technology on our vehicles, um, can enhance the safety and the speed and the performance of human, human driven race cars. So if, if you were to give, um, one of the top drivers, a vehicle that had 360 degree perception systems, LIDAR, radar, optical, uh, advanced positioning systems like GPS for localization, um, give them, you know, drive by wire technology and, and other kind of crash avoidance systems. Um, I think what you would, what you would see is an opportunity for motorsport to go beyond the, the barrier that they've reached right now of say, you know, 220, 230 miles an hour. I think they could reach higher speeds. Uh, and they could do so safely with without putting the driver's lives um, uh, at, at risk the way they would the way they the way they are you know today at those higher speeds. So um, I think it's less likely that that our uh, initiative is going to lead to autonomous race cars driving against humans. Although I guess it's possible in the future sometime. I think it's far more likely that the technology that we're proving out will migrate to commercial applications on highways and on to race cars uh, that are driven by humans. Very good. How exciting. Uh, speaking about migrating to some of those uh, consumer applications and, and how that might affect those consumer vehicles, can you tell us a little bit more about why uh, this autonomous vehicle challenge and the technologies uh, that you're developing within that uh, are important uh, for driving those consumer uh, technologies? Uh, why, why is this important uh, within the development of that? Yeah, so I'm, I'll, I'll give you the, the the answer from a technology development and validation standpoint. And then there's another value proposition that this competition provides to industry around talent development. But uh, in terms of uh, what's being done in, uh, on the vehicle, the, the race cars and the entire kind of racing concept is really a, a test bed, a proving ground for uh, cutting edge autonomous hardware and software technology. So we are putting on these race cars, LIDAR, radar, uh, optical sensors, which is essentially cameras, um, advanced computers, uh, drive-by-wire systems, GPS systems, um, and then a whole bunch of, of, of software, base software, and then obviously the advanced algorithms that the university teams are, are, are coding for these vehicles. Um, all of that is, is essentially what you need for an autonomous vehicle to operate on public roads or on highways. And there's plenty of testing going on for these types of systems on, um, you know, suburban roads and urban roads, uh, whether it's Waymo or, or, or Uber or others, uh, th there's lots of autonomous vehicle pilots that are have been going on logging lots and lots of miles, probably millions of miles. Um, but what they're not doing is testing these edge cases of, of high speed encounters. What happens when you have, you know, two autonomous vehicles running completely different algorithms. So imagine a, a Tesla vehicle and a Waymo vehicle that, that find themselves encountering each other in a high speed situation on a highway at 70, 80 miles an hour. And, 
you know, something happens that's unexpected, what are the cars going to do? Uh, and, and how do you test that? And so what we're doing is, is proving out how does that technology work in these edge cases? And it's incredibly valuable to, to the industry. Um, the other value proposition is that our teams are, are not typical racing teams. This, this isn't, uh, you know, Team Andretti or Team Penske that you would see in IndyCar. Um, these are universities. This is, you know, MIT, Auburn, Virginia, Purdue University, University of Hawaii, uh, Technical University of Munich, Polytechnic of Milan, and so on and so forth. Uh, KAIST from Korea. So these teams are elite engineering universities uh, that have uh, assembled some of the best and brightest uh, PhD students, other types of graduate students, actual faculty, uh, professional engineers that, that make up these teams. And the training they're getting solving real world problems on the racetrack is invaluable from the industry talent development standpoint. So let's say we've got, we've got probably 500 people involved in the autonomous challenge. And, you know, I think that that is a, a, an arm, a small army of talent that's going to go into the industry and make a real big difference uh, in the future. Definitely. How exciting. How exciting. Speak, speaking to that a little bit, and, and you mentioned some of the, the universities that are involved uh, within the challenge uh, market scale, uh, very much uh, world's leading business to business platform. And so we're very excited, too, to learn uh, more about some of the companies and the universities, some of the strategic partners that are really important in, in establishing this foundation of autonomous head to head vehicle racing. Would you would you mind sharing uh, some of the companies and universities uh, involved uh, within your efforts? Yeah, so let me start with the, some of the, the, the companies, the, the sponsors, um, and, and our sponsors really are, are um, not just there to put their logo on the car, they're there to provide a core technology uh, to the vehicle. Um, and, and on the autonomous side, we, we work very closely. One of our main sponsors is Luminar. Uh, they're uh, one of the top um, industry players in, in the LiDAR technology space you know, a fast growing company that, um, you know, uh, is, is, is now supplying a number of, of major OEMs with their product. Um, we have uh, Aptiv, uh, which has been in the autonomous space for quite a while. I really a spin out of Delphi that has its roots actually in, in Indiana, uh, not far from here in, in uh, Kokomo, Indiana. Um, and uh, they provide the radar uh, systems. Uh, our drive-by-wire system is from a, a German company, Schaeffler. Uh, they acquired a, a company, Paravan, and, and created a, a joint venture, Schaeffler Paravan, that is supplying what they call the Space Drive, uh, cool name, um, which is uh, the drive-by-wire system that, that allows the vehicle to, to operate without a human in there, you know, turning the steering or, or pushing on the brakes. Um, we have, uh, one of our, one of our top sponsors and, and was a presenting sponsor for our event at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in October is Cisco. Uh, they provide the technology that's critical for, uh, the, the supporting infrastructure. So our cars, in order to, for them to really race, they need to have, uh, perception systems on board the vehicle, but they also have to be able to communicate, uh, frankly with each other and, and communicate with the, the track and, and the infrastructure around the track. And so that's provided through a, uh, a low latency, uh, extremely um, uh, high um, uh, ability, uh, wireless uh, network that's uh, built out at the track using uh, technology provided by, by Cisco. So it's kind of like um, Wi-Fi on steroids, if you will, right? It's, it's, it's a Wi-Fi system that's able to be uh, extreme low latency uh, which you need things that way when you're talking about cars going 150 miles an hour. Um, lots of other sponsors. I'm sure I've missed, I've missed a few. Uh, and, and we do have some that are more just traditional racing, um, uh, you know, components. So that the tires are, have historically been provided by Bridgestone and they've got uh, um, some technology on those tires that, that uh, they're learning about from a sensor standpoint. So um Lots of great industry uh, partners. From the university side, um, this has really been a global competition. Uh, when we launched it, there were 41 universities that signed up. And the first year of the competition was all simulation based. Uh, we had a simulator that was provided um, uh, through the cloud that teams could access and upload their, their algorithms and essentially compete with each other in, a, in, in simulation races. 
uh, that became increasingly harder. And so that that weeded some universities out uh, by kind of showing them, you know, maybe they needed to advance their uh, algorithm development before they took the risk of, of buying a race car and, and sending a team to the U.S. Um, we also unfortunately lost a number of teams just due to COVID. Um, there were some teams that I'm very confident would be on the track today, but for COVID, we had a really great team from, from India, a really great team from Israel um, that, that unfortunately had to drop out um, uh, of the competition before the, the on-track portion. Um, and, uh, but, but those who are there today, it's a mix of US-based and, and international universities some of them operate their own team. So one university is running the team themselves. Others have partnered. So you have multiple universities that have formed a team together. Um, and we've got uh, nine of them in, in total. So just to kind of run through the, the teams, you've got Technical University of Munich. Um, and, and they um, won, the, won the first competition at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which was a uh, single car competition, so time trials. Um, we've they've got a, a team called Polymove that's made up of uh, University, uh, Technical University of Milan and University of Alabama. So it's actually a partnership between an Italian elite university and a U.S. university. Um, uh, and they won the competition at uh, Las Vegas Motor Speedway, the Autonomous Challenge at, at CES. Um, a team called Euro Racing. Um, and uh, they are primarily led by um, uh, the uh, Technical University in Modena, uh, Polytech of, of Modena uh, in Italy. Um, and they partnered with uh, an institute actually in, in the United Arab Emirates uh, in Abu Dhabi called the Technical Innovation Institute. So there you've got kind of a European and Middle Eastern uh, uh, partnered team. They've done very well. Um, there is a team from the University of Virginia, Cavalier Racing, um, led by a, a professor that's really brilliant, Modder Bell, and, and they've done very well. They've been, really been one of the top U.S. teams uh, from, a, from a speed standpoint and an ability to, to, to pass. Um, uh, there is a, a university from uh, Korea, KAIST, uh, that's uh, one of the top uh, really probably the top engineering institute in Korea and South Korea uh, done very well and, and have been one of the very committed uh, teams in, in, in each of our rounds. Um, we have uh, a team from the University of Hawaii that is um, uh, partnered with um, uh, some other institutions, I think most notably uh, UC San Diego. Um, uh, They've got some support from some other universities, but the primary partners are University of Hawaii and UC San Diego. Um, there is a, a team from Auburn uh, that, that uh, has done very well. They were one of the first to, to actually successfully complete fully autonomous laps uh, on, on a racetrack. Um, there is uh, uh, a team from uh, uh, Purdue University uh, that's partnered with West Point. Um, so the U.S. Military uh, Academy is, is involved in, in one of the teams. And then uh, last but not least uh, is, is the team that's really the mix of multiple universities. Um, uh, it's called MIT Pitt RW. R MIT Pitt, yeah, RW, which is for MIT, Pittsburgh, Rochester Institute of Technology, and the University of Waterloo in Canada. So there's, there's four universities. And the, the thing that makes that team really quite interesting is they're, they're very much student led. So most of these teams I just described, the, the, the universities are deeply involved. The academic institutions are providing funding, faculty time and, and, and uh, accessing alumni for raising dollars. Uh, the MIT Pitt RW team is really led by graduate students uh, from each of these institutions. And they've gone out and raised their own money and they've done an amazing job bringing in some real top-notch sponsors, Waymo, Oracle, I mean, you know, big global names that, that your listeners would know well. So uh, what makes that kind of cool is they're sort of the entrepreneurial team in the sense that these young um, uh, professionals are not only, you know, doing the technical work, uh, but they're also, you know, out there raising money and, and really operating it like a business. And they, I think they pulled some, some of the uh, talent from the business schools uh, at, at MIT and, uh, to help in, in lead the, leading the kind of fundraising efforts, which is really neat to see. So 
thanks for letting me share that. I, you know, I always, always want to talk about the teams and um, I do, I really do think it's important that people understand that, that what we're trying to do is, is, is cool and, and exciting on a, uh, from a, from an entertainment standpoint, but at its core, it's really a, a university applied research program to develop talent and accelerate technology commercialization. And, you know, we're just doing that in a very, a very public and very cool way. Definitely, definitely. Well, thank you so much for for taking the time to to list those uh, institutions of higher education and and some of those partners and and sponsors and and what a list you have. Uh, just just going through some of the the leading universities uh, internationally and and top companies within their respective uh, industries really have some powerful organizations uh, behind the racing series. So really excited to to learn more about that. Uh, automotive racing, of, of course, is such a an international sport, and it sounds like your organization is is truly representative of that. Yeah, I think um, w- when we when we launched it as a, a as a prize competition and and uh, I, we thought we would we would we, we, we knew we had talked to a number of universities. We were confident that we'd have maybe 10, 15 universities sign up and most of them were, were going to be from the U.S. We had a couple from international. So when when 41 universities signed up, um, representing i think it was like 14 different countries um across four continents it was you know we were blown away by the level of interest and so i think um going forward we're, we're, we're going to try to find ways to help some of those teams that aspired to be in this competition but couldn't uh either because technologically they, they just weren't there yet uh, uh to, to use your guys favorite term and um and at the same time maybe they were faced with just barriers around COVID and, and traveling internationally that made it impossible for them to, to compete. We're, we're looking to create on-ramps for more teams to get involved. And we've had great conversations with a number of institutions that are, that are wanting to do that. Um, so I think, you know, uh, we're not done in terms of uh, uh, attracting university involvement and, and, and as, I, as you said, making this event very global um, for, for the future. Definitely, definitely. Well, that that's so exciting. Well, what a great foundation in terms of those those companies and uh, and institutions that have really kind of set this foundation for the series and and are leading uh, the way. Uh, but but equally exciting too to hear some of those companies that were affected with COVID are going to have a second opportunity within the series and and very confident that just uh, with with what you've achieved so far that you'll attract many many more companies and and uh, universities to participate in the series as well. So I know that uh, we all look forward to to seeing how that expands and how. Uh, more and more companies and and uh, institutions of higher education get involved. So confident that uh, that that's going to happen. Um, when I know you mentioned Purdue, uh, I, I understand Paul as well that you're uh, based in Indianapolis. Uh, would love to learn a little bit more about why uh, Indianapolis and, and Indiana uh, as a state uh, is important to the development of this series, and would love to just learn a little bit more about that foundation that we know Indiana has provided uh, for the racing series, and, and also would be excited to learn a little bit more about how you originally uh, became uh, involved with the series, uh, as we know the state has as well. Yeah, no. Um, so, I mean, first of all, Indiana has has kind of long been home to the racing capital of the world uh, at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the Indy 500. And, you know, the, the roots of that, um, that amazing track and, and that that institution uh, is is in automotive technology proving ground. So when when the Indy Motor Speedway, Indianapolis Motor Speedway is built in uh, the turn of the century, um, it was built as a test track for automotive companies to prove out, you know, the horseless carriage. And Indiana um, at that time uh, was really the, the to, sort of like the Silicon Valley of the early automobile. Um, some of the, the, the great uh, automobiles, whether it's, um, you know, the, the Studebakers and the Stutz Bearcat and, and these amazing vehicles that you'd see in you know, movies about the 1920s were, were designed and built in Indiana and, and the technology was being tested at the racetrack at the, at the Indy 500. And so, um, you know, a few years ago, uh, the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, which is the state's kind of Department of Commerce, you know, partnered with uh, the organization I lead Energy Systems Network and said, you know, what can we do to bring back the the history and the the idea of uh, Indiana as a proving ground for automotive technology. 
Um, and can it be relevant to motorsport? Can it be relevant to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and, and the legacy we have uh, with lots of racing teams here? Delara, uh, the Italian automobile manufacturer, race car manufacturer has its North American headquarters here and builds, builds these carbon fiber uh, Indy cars uh, here in, in Indianapolis. Um, you know, the engine companies that build performance engines. So the whole industry is here. And, um, you know, we, we thought about it and, and thought maybe autonomous vehicles would be the right, uh, the right niche because industry is making you know, huge investments in autonomous vehicles. Indiana, as many states are doing, is seeking to compete for those invest investments from industry and to attract the talent uh, that are going to create companies that will support that industry. Um, and so that's really where the, the concept came of, uh, of running a prize competition. And, uh, and it was actually another Indiana institution, the Lilly Endowment, which was a very large philanthropic foundation, you know, that was established many years ago by the Lilly family of Eli Lilly, the pharmaceutical giant uh, that's based here in Indiana. Uh, and they provided um, a significant grant to us to, to get this program launched and to have the ability to give out a million dollars to the winner. And, and then we partnered with the uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway, um, this, this iconic venue that uh, uh, was willing to take the risk on letting us uh, run some autonomous vehicles uh, on that famed oval track, uh, which we did in October uh, of last year. And so all along, this has really been a collaboration among some key institutions in the state of Indiana. Now, though, uh, as we look forward, I mean, the return on investment for all of us has been that uh, we now have relationships with these uh, amazing universities and companies from around the world that are advancing the state of the art in autonomous technology. Um, some of them are, are looking to, to locate their spin out companies uh, here in Indiana, um, kind of co-locating around the Indy Autonomous Challenge. Um, you know, we've got a, a facility that we're building out uh, in Indianapolis where um, the cars will be based where we'll be able to do testing and validation of autonomous technology and, and build and support these race cars and support the teams. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's exciting to, to see what this can mean from a placemaking standpoint, um, in, in Indianapolis. And at the same time, make sure that what we're doing is, 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 uh, seen by people around the world and is relevant to, to industry around the world. So our events are likely to continue to occur. Um, at different tracks and different locations uh, uh, over the over the next uh, year and a half or a year plus. How exciting! What a, what a great ecosystem uh, for the for the sport. And it sounds like Indiana has just been uh, a very early uh, supporter of the series, and uh, just so exciting to hear. It sounds like you're really becoming Indianapolis uh, as as it has that racing heritage, as you mentioned. Uh, really, the the epicenter now for autonomous vehicle racing. So very excited to to hear that. Uh, as you mentioned too, have have had some some huge wins already. Have demonstrated uh, the technology through the time trials, as you mentioned, and most recently here with the head-to-head uh, -head competition. And so I think you've, you've clearly demonstrated that head-to-head uh, -head autonomous driverless uh, racing competition is, is in fact here. We are there. And so uh, I'm very excited to, to learn a little bit more now about what's next. Uh, what's next for the racing series over the next couple of years, five, even 10 years? Uh, what do you see uh, as the future of the sport? One of the things we've been really careful about is, is not projecting too far into the future. So I, I, I don't, I don't really have any idea where we'll be in, you know, five to 10 years, or if there'll be a need for, uh, in the autonomous challenge in, in that time frame. Um, what I do think we, we're focused on right now is, is we still, um, have some additional, um, boxes to check, if you will, um, around, uh, uh, oval racing. And so, um, we're looking to organize another, uh, uh, competition uh, in the fall time frame, um, summer, early fall time frame. Uh, not sure exactly what the venue is going to be yet. Uh, have some options that we're, we're looking at, um, and, but it'll be on an oval. And, and the goal there will be to increase speed and, and to also increase kind of the, even the complexity level of the passing that takes place. Uh, I think we'll stick with the, the two car head to head format. Uh, we really like it. The, the audience likes it. It's, it's, it's actually kind of cool. I mean, the idea of thinking, imagine, you know, uh, Castro Neves and, and uh, uh, you know, I don't know, Lewis Hamilton or something, you know, going at it two cars at a time 
you know, passing each other almost in a game of chicken to see who, who has to give up first. Um, so that, that, that format, I think really was, um, was easy to digest and exciting uh, in Las Vegas. So we'll continue with it, but what we'll do is increase speeds. And I think the teams are, are eager to do that. Um, so that that's going to involve some adjustments to the car um, to, to, to boost the speeds. Um, and, and we may make some other, you know, adjustments to some of the components and the technology just to make sure we're, we're ready for those higher speeds. Um, we'd love to get up to the, you know, the, the high 180s, 190s, maybe even above 200 miles an hour. Uh, the, the Indy Lights car uh, that races, which is the kind of chassis that our uh, autonomous race car is based off, we call our car the Delara AV21. And it's based off of uh, the Indy Lights Delara chassis, which is um, uh, the IL-15. And so that that vehicle and the Indy Light Series, they, they, they don't go much above 200. They're kind of in the 190s, 200. So if, if we can get to a point where our cars can run at the limit and at the speed that is, is kind of the max for that type of uh, a vehicle, that'd be pretty cool. Uh, and we hope to do that in, in the fall. And then, you know, um, we're looking at uh, whether we're able to go back and, and uh, be a part of CES again. We, we, we absolutely loved CES. It's been an amazing uh, partnership, uh, being able to showcase the, the car when we first had the prototype at, at CES 21, 2021, which was all virtual, and then to hold our event this year at, at CES 2022. You know, I think uh, we're certainly looking at um, you know, uh, that as another event uh, uh, going into next year. Um, and, and then we're talking about what's next after that. I think, I think there's an opportunity for us to, uh, take a step back and look at refreshing some of the autonomous technology on the car in the 2023 timeframe. So we want to make sure that the, the, the race cars are always bleeding edge. Um, so we don't want legacy technology. We want the absolute newest stuff because that's what you need to do testing and validation, uh, to help the industry go further. So. Many of our current sponsors, um, the, the technology that we're using, they will have a new next gen product that they want to test out in, in 2023. And so there'll be some, some modifications that'll be needed to the car to bring on maybe a new LiDAR system, a new drive-by-wire system, a new compute system, perhaps from the same sponsors, perhaps some new sponsors coming in as well. Um, you know, and then you know, one of the things we have to think about too is whether we want to tackle um, road courses. So right now we've been, you know, exclusively focused on ovals. Um, and that's exciting because ovals are where you can go really fast. Um, but there's also value to, uh, showcasing this technology, um, in a road course format where, you know, you're, you're making multiple turns and, you know, having to navigate around a, a road course, which might be more similar to what, you know, autonomous vehicles are going to encounter in, in, in a highway or, you know, on, a, on, on roads. Um, so that, that would be a different format for us and something that, uh, we're, we're exploring. What I, what I will say is I don't, I don't see this becoming a, I, I know we've used the term series, but in the motorsports world, a series is typically something where you have, you know, several races, uh, many cases, you know, every other weekend or something, you know, spread throughout the year, like NASCAR or formula one or IndyCar. And, and we're not looking to do that. Um, the, the way this is set up in order for us to continue to advance the technology for these university teams to be involved, to have the research element and the, the learning and adjusting element to the technology, I think it's far more likely that this will be something where we run these competitions, you know, two, maybe three a year um, at most and, and try to create enough space between the competitions so that you can make adjustments to the race cars so that teams can do their research and really advance the technology. I think if you look at uh, traditional motorsport, you know, one of the challenges is if you have to run um, every weekend or every other weekend, and then when that season's over, maybe you've got a few months before you got to get up and do it again. Uh, it can be really difficult to bring new technologies or new advancements onto those platforms because you don't want to make a change in the middle of the season. And you got rules you got to worry about. So for us, you know, having that space and time in between these events, I think makes a lot of sense. And also just, with university-based teams, you know, they got to take tests, they got to teach classes, they got to write papers. You know, they're they're not uh, professional race car uh, drivers. This isn't their day job, so to say. 
Uh, so yeah, so I think that's kind of a, a, a thumbnail sketch of, of what we have ahead of us. Um, you know, obviously we'll be very, we'll be able to give, share a lot more specifics on exact dates and exact tracks and, and timing of everything, uh, here in the coming uh, months. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's a very exciting future. I mean, you're, you're talking about, uh, higher speeds and, and even better improving, uh, vehicles, more companies, more sponsors, more institutions of higher education uh, that are getting uh, involved. So, so it sounds like a very uh, exciting future that that lays ahead as well. Uh, speaking to that, as I mentioned to you, uh, today's interview will be uh, featured first at MarketScale.com, uh, world's leading business to business uh, media platform. And so, I know that there's going to be a lot of individuals, uh, organization, other universities that are going to be very excited to uh, learn more about uh, everything that you're doing within autonomous vehicle racing and certainly are going to want to become involved uh, themselves. Would you mind sharing with us uh, a best way for, for such organizations and uh, universities uh, to reach out to express interest uh, that are excited in, in working with you and your efforts? You know, the easiest thing to do is is just go to, to the website, www.indieautonomouschallenge.com. Um, there's tons of information there. There's There's all kinds of uh, you know, links and things to, to our past work. But one of the things that's really kind of cool about um, uh, what we're doing is, is the desire to collaborate. And so um, on that same website, you can find links and contact information for each of the teams. Um, and, and you can reach out to the teams and have conversations with them about whether or not, you know, there's a way you can support them either as a sponsor, of your company, uh, or, uh, or, you know, uh, an, another university that's looking to partner. Um, and then of course you can reach out to, to, to us that kind of, you know, are organizing this and have conversations. So, you know, now is the right time. So if you have listeners that are, that are interested, you know, now is the time to, to express that interest. Um, because obviously, you know, we have to make decisions about, you know, building additional race cars and teams have to, you know, come up with their, uh, uh, their partnerships and, and solidify those. So, um, you know, springtime is really when, uh, we're going to be, you know, charting that path forward for an event in the fall and, and then subsequent events. So, um, I think, I think your listeners can, uh, find most of what they need on that website. Perfect. Very good. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. We really do appreciate it. And I know there's going to be many individuals and, and organizations as a result of uh, today's podcast uh, that'll be uh, joining in and, and reaching out. So thank you so much uh, for sharing that. I really do appreciate it. And uh, Paul, I just I want to say what a pleasure it was to get to spend some time uh, with you here today. It really was a pleasure uh, getting to speak with you and learning more about the exciting developments that are that are happening within head to head autonomous uh, vehicle racing. So Paul, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know definitely uh, market scale, myself included, will be at that next race. So we'll, yeah. we'll look forward to that and supporting in, in every way that uh, we can. So thank you again so much for your time. And we wish you uh, best of luck uh, within uh, future efforts within the project. Thanks. We'll look forward to uh, to having you guys be part of the part of the journey. It's it's uh, it's been fun and we got a lot more work to do. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Take care. Right. Take care.